Taking a coveted Japanese badge from the ashes of the 90s and placing it on a sports car with BMW DNA is a risky marketing proposition. Some loyalists downright reject this, while others like us believe the future of sports cars lie in collaboration. This is the updated and more powerful 2021 Toyota Supra. I'm sitting inside the new, new Toyota Supra, the 2021. That's correct, after just one model year, they've made some major revisions. However, the interior space remains largely unchanged. I'm sitting in the four-cylinder variant, which reduces the cost of this vehicle significantly. They've stripped away some features, of course. Here, I have Alcantara seats instead of leather, which are far superior to me in terms of a driving experience. They're more grippy, and it feels more purposeful for what this car is trying to be. It has a complete BMW interior space, and there is a few things that's wrong with that. It needs some specific Toyota touches, and I think that's what's lacking. But here's the thing. It doesn't look like a 3 Series. It doesn't look like an X5. This feels very purposeful, very designed specifically to be a driver-focused cockpit. And the only car I can compare it to is the Z4 M Coupe that we just did. This is an evolution of that. People that love that car will love this interior space. There's low glare materials on the dashboard, the upper dash, the doors. It feels durable. It feels well built and all the controls and everything that you interact with is really good. Now there is some piano gloss crap on the center part and it is disgusting in here like every other car. There's a nice use of carbon fiber. But again, this is a specific interior design for a sports car. I like that a lot. So. There are some optional stuff like the JBL sound system and a few other things that add cost to this, but you know, all of the rest of it is the same as the six cylinder. And I think that's a good time to go into the shop to talk about the mechanical changes, which is the majority of what they've done to this car. So let's get started with that. We're in the shop with not just one, but two new pre-production prototype Toyota Supras. The inline six, which has been heavily revised to make significantly more horsepower and a few more pounds of torque, and the new two liter GR Supra, the four cylinder, basically the same four cylinder you get in the Z4. But before I talk about what they've done to this new six, I'm gonna talk about the differences between the two liter and the three liter in suspension tuning, rear differential, and all the other fun nitty gritty details. So let's talk about the suspension first, Jack. Under the, un, under the car, the front half of the six cylinder what did they do so they basically tightened up the front end of the six to get this car to become more of a precision instrument the prior generation was more of a gt car and once you started driving it hard it was kind of all over the place so they've tried to refine that and they're going to do this every model year it's something that toyota and most manufacturers do with sports cars they make these little tiny tweaks to suspension here and there to keep them constant the constant improving so the six cylinder gets adaptive dampers where in the Ford you get fixed dampers and when they tuned the suspension in that car they went for an entirely different demographic in the six at least according to the call we had with Jack Collis 
The six is targeted to be more of a track day weapon and enthusiast car, where the four cylinder is obviously the price leader being substantially cheaper, but it's more of a GT car and it's tuned that way. In the rear, this six obviously has more suspension changes, but most notably is the way the four has been tuned. They have an entirely different rear differential unit. The six has a clutch pack style diff, which allows you to do hellacious slides or drive in a more refined manner around a track where the four cylinder is really fighting to give you as much mechanical grip on corner exit. Yeah, and the four cylinder has a much better mechanical feel to it in terms of the, the traditional sense that you, you get grip and it snaps when you don't get grip in the back. It's a little bit more edgy, but also more precise. And it's, it's definitely designed for a different demographic, but if somebody wants to autocross that car, the four cylinder would be far more ideal on tighter courses. Again, some of that's about cost cutting, but when you look at the BMW Z4, they, the base car does get the same differential, but they do have a track pack on the Z4, which is the one we looked at where they get the M differential. So some of these things you're gonna see BMW doing, if you keep an eye on what BMW is doing with their model changes, you're gonna see a lot of this follow into the Toyota, guaranteed. The joys of shared development costs. Correct. The next thing to bring up though is the trans. It is identical. Gear ratios and all, the same identical mechanical unit in the four and the six. So if you're driving the four cylinder, you feel that some of the gear ratios are clearly meant for a more powerful vehicle, but the, the, the gearbox itself being a ZF unit is incredible. It's one of the best torque converted automatics that you're gonna get into. Are there faster, better transmissions? Yes, but at this price point, it is a great mix for daily driving and fun driving. It's super responsive, but we're gonna talk more about that in the drive. Now let's talk about some of the last differences about the underneath you can't tell the difference between the four and the six cylinder underneath when you look at it. The front suspension, much like we talked about in the previous super video, which you, if you want intense detail, go watch my original super video because I go about the, talk about the architecture and all that. The front half of this car is from the M2. The uprights, the control arms, everything is from there. So this is very M car up front. The other thing that Toyota has added to the front of this car is the strut tower braces that connect the strut towers to the radiator support. And this is where some of the confusion in marketing comes in. Because when I talked to Tata-san, I asked why the first model year didn't have these. And he said, well, it's because it's already rigid enough. We don't need it. Because the Z4 had them, the Supra didn't. Now the Supra has it. And what you're gonna need to know is that every single year, Toyota is gonna constantly make changes like this to this car. So if you're an early adopter that bought the first model year and you have the original six cylinder that came in there, tough, tough, tough luck. Because Jack, Jack from Toyota explained to us. Basically their whole plan with the Supra and it makes sense from a marketing standpoint is to sell the same number of cars every single year. And the only way to accomplish that is to do a big change every year. So maybe next year they'll hopefully add a manual or they'll do a track edition. They're gonna do a major change or some special edition every single year because they wanna sell the same number of cars from the beginning of their production run to the end. Yes, and it's painful to make an enthusiast car for an enthusiast because you have to develop this to a whole different level than like a Chevy Spark. People will go and abuse these so it takes way more money, time and development. And then you have the enthusiasts that beat on them, complain about them, they don't sell a lot of them. But then on the other side, from the enthusiast perspective, you get burned if you're an early adopter. If you buy the second model year, you know they're get, may, probably gonna add a manual from everything I've heard. So you have to be smart about this. Is this enough for you? Or do you wanna wait it out? But tell me about the changes to the, the inline six. So the inline six has an entirely different head design, which allows them to produce way more power. This has a lower compression ratio, and it has new pistons. Okay. This, one of the major changes from the B58 of the first model year was the cylinder head design. Like you said, it had an integrated water jacket, which is typically done for emissions and fuel economy standards. All the coolant is flowed through the head through that water jacket. So that basically has the head ports. You have two exhaust ports, and everything else is blocked out. So with this, a traditional head, you see an exhaust outlet for all six cylinders. And the hope is, well, it's gonna make a hell of a lot more power. It's gonna be easier to tune and work with, with for the aftermarket. So this would be the ideal solution. So Toyota claims 380 odd horsepower for the 2021. In reality, this specific car, and again, this is a pre-production model, one car and driver had it, 
made 388 wheel horsepower, which means at the crank you're making well north of 400 horsepower. Which would also make sense to why this car is equally as fast as your Grand Sport C7 Corvette. I mean, it pulls on it. It's, I mean, in some cases it's just as fast, and I think that just shows how much overhead this car has. Now, this is a prototype, so it could be a ringer. We don't know what the final motor will make in terms of horsepower on a dyno, so just be aware of that. Don't take it as gospel. Now, there's other things to talk about. The Pilot Super Sports that are on here are a last generation tire, and I asked Michelin about why they did that, and they said, well, this car was built and designed years ago, so it was homologated for the older tires. So if they had to go and update it to the 4S, then they would have to go make suspension tuning changes and all these little tweaks that they do to change tires. So there's a lot of detail that you would never talk about in a regular car that you have to talk about here. And we could go on and on. Is there anything else that you want to bring up? Quickly, because we're on the tire mark, let's talk about the sizes. The four cylinder gets a smaller diameter wheel, but the mechanical grip, this has the identical widths in the front and the rear in the six and the four. So you get 255 fronts, 275 rears. And the last thing to bring up, and you really, really don't feel it on the street, is that the six cylinder has a four piston brake where the Four, where the four cylinder has single piston. If you're going on a track, you want the six cylinder. Uh, just for the, a lot of the brake capacity, you're gonna smoke the four cylinder pretty quickly. I mean, I could tell a little on bit of fame. On the street though. On the street, it's not as big of a difference. Um, you know, there's other BMW stuff here to discuss before we get into the drive. And one of the big things about the refinement of modern cars, and we talk about this endlessly, how it's not as raw as some of the older cars. And when you look at the underbody, you see all the sealers, you see all the treatments for aerodynamics. And on the back of this car, there are two frequency isolators on the differential mount, one for low frequency and one for mid-range frequency. So they're trying to kill some of those, or trying to isolate vibration from you. And there's all these little things that they do in this car that it's not the purest thing ever, but this is about as good as you're gonna get from a design perspective. It's all about compromise, and I don't think people understand that. Enthusiasts are a fickle bunch, as we mentioned before, and if manufacturers built only enthusiast cars, they'd all be bankrupt. Oh geez, here we go. So Mark is probably back there right now telling you waxing lyrical about how wonderful the four cylinder is, how it's everything you could ask for in a, let's say, a relatively inexpensive car, how it's more balanced than this six is, how it's all the power you could ever need on the street. And I'm here to tell you, yeah, okay, this six cylinder is incredible, genuinely. I never say that about cars, but given its price point, God, this thing is really good. Listen to that. Now, before I talk about the engine and how, do how it really dominates the entire experience, I'm gonna talk about some of the nitty gritty differences in suspension tuning, specifically between the four and the six. So the six cylinder gets adjustable dampers. Big shock there. It has a greater range of adjustment, but despite the 200 pound weight difference in the four cylinder's favor, this six has much, much better body control. It feels way more planted in every corner. Now, the other thing I like about the six is the way it slides. Yes, it does feel like a BMW in that regards, meaning it feels like there's a little bit of anesthetic in your butt and you don't really feel the car break away. But what you do get is a very predictable breakaway point. As I'm about to demonstrate. <laughs> well, now let's talk about the engine. And that's, again, that's what makes this car so impressive for its price. It creates, it creates a tremendous amount of torque, basically immediately off the start and it's as fast now allegedly it's as fast as a c7 and we 
may or may not have drag raced both cars and really most of the time in the real world this car is incredibly quick it is noticeably faster than the original 2020 model i can't do a burnout in my four cylinder but what i can do is talk about a few things that i know jack is going to poo poo and we spent a ton of time behind these, the wheel of these cars. And one thing that I've learned getting into the four cylinder, and this was thanks to the Z4 in an autocross, is this is one of the best balanced newer cars that you can get that is a great learning tool. It's not too fast, so you don't have to be overwhelmed with the horsepower of the newer Supra with the three liter. So what this allows you to do is have way more balance out of corners. You can put your foot down and coming out of a corner, you don't have to be so ginger about how you apply the throttle. So I can come in deeper, I can hit the brakes, the car rotates on its own. It rotates all the way through the turn and you let the car do the work for you and you can throttle out a lot easier than you can with a three liter. Now suspension. This does not have adaptive dampers, it does not have any electronic control of the dampers, and the benefit of that is, well, you don't have the complication, the cost, and it would be easier to swap them out. But the negative part is, well, you're stuck kind of in this medium firm setting. It's somewhere in between the six cylinder Supra, and in certain conditions, bad payment, you notice it a lot more, but it's not an overly firm driving experience. They found that balance of taking it to the most extreme that they possibly could without being annoying. Now, in terms of all the other attributes, if all you're doing is going in a straight line, this is, I mean, Jack's gonna walk away from me with the six cylinder. It's just so much faster. And one of the big negative parts about the four, the four popper is it just runs out of steam. I mean, your fuel cutoff is right around 6,000 RPMs. The fun is over, all the torque is down low. So it doesn't, it doesn't want to rev. And this car feels like it needs that. And that's a huge advantage of the six cylinder version. You have more power, it feels like it revs more, it wants to rev more. So you trade off one thing. Do you want more balance? Do you want the more neutral experience? Do you want better dynamics and slower corners? Well, you choose the four popper. If you want more power, uh, more drama, more difficulty to drive, you choose the six cylinder. When you, of course, combine the fact that it has fake engine noise in sport mode, much like the inline six, and the synthesized effect through the speakers is almost identical. And it's, it's just, makes it feel so, I don't know, so cheesy, if, if I had a way to put it. And then the last part is, since this is a lot of BMW, almost completely BMW underneath, it feels like I'm sitting on lidocaine. It has the same problem that a lot of the modern BMW cars have, and it's just indicative of modern cars in general. You can't get away from this. You don't feel a whole lot. Even when the car starts to slide, you have to judge by looking forward and seeing where the no nose is pointed more so than the actual car, what the car is doing, because you don't feel a lot underneath you like a lot of the older cars. Everything is refined. A lot of the harsher edges have been kind of smoothed out. I don't know. I, I complain about this all the time in newer vehicles, and it's just the way that it is. But I'm gonna say these two cars are one of the most joy joyful experiences you can have in this generation or this era of vehicles. And if you're looking for something like this, this is one of the best examples of a modern sports car. It has a very connected feeling on the interior. It's different, it's unique. People, people's eyes pop out of their head when this drives by, unlike a lot of these luxury cars turned sports cars. It just feels a little bit more special. It helps to build that emotional bond with the, with the machine that you're driving. Now, there are, of course, other negatives to that, which we're gonna talk about in the final thoughts, but as a driving machine, I'm so impressed with this, and I'm so impressed with the six-cylinder version that it's just, for the price, it's hard to beat this. Final thoughts on the 2021 Toyota Supra, the new four cylinder and updated inline six. These cars are three pedals away from greatness. 
And I know in sports you hear this all the time. Oh, we're just a few pieces away and uh, we'll have perfection. The Supra is not about perfection. It's about creating a connection with the driver. And having a manual transmission in a car like the Supra would help it a ton. Because my biggest complaint about it is the BMW-ness. The numbness that is built into it by design. You just don't feel a whole hell of a lot. And the problem is modern turbocharged engines. It doesn't matter what manufacturer it is, you don't hear anything. You don't hear it like you used to with naturally aspirated motors. The induction noise isn't there, so they have to augment it with fake engine noise. And then you have to augment the exhaust to have pops and bangs and all this synthetic stuff that's going on. And you just, you can't get in the headspace to feel like you're, you're controlling the machine. So the manual transmission option, when and if they add it, is going to make a huge difference to this car. That said, this is one of the best automatic transmissions you're ever going to drive that's torque converted. And what you get with the revised inline six in this 2021 model is nothing short of crazy. For around $50,000, I'm not kidding you, like 15 years ago, this would be supercar levels of fast. It is nutty how quick this car is compared to a lot of the other sports cars. It just pulls and pulls. And I think it's such a strong foundation that you know if they choose to add more power to it, they can. There's more engine options. And I, I'm so excited to see where the car goes. Granted, if you're an early, early adopter, I'm sorry, but you know there's a lot of overhead on this car for what they can do. The suspension changes to the inline six are subtle. The rear end just feels less nervous to me. And I couldn't take these out on track because they were prototypes. And I know there's some concern about the stability of the rear end on these cars, but under hundred miles an hour, I don't feel it. And these are not race cars. They're not track cars. So I, I kind of give them a pass on certain characteristics. When you get to the extreme limit, yes, you're gonna expose deficiencies, but I didn't see any. The four cylinder specifically is a great feeder car. It's a great car for somebody to learn how to drive rear wheel drive. It's got a near perfect 50-50 weight distribution and cross balance, much like the inline six, but it, it just feels easy to work with. You can learn what the car's doing. You can learn how to move the rear end around safely without putting it into a pull. And if you want more of a challenge, the inline six will do that for you. It's very twitchy on throttle. Still, you have to learn how to work with throttle control using the weight balance of the car and all that power, it's an exciting drive, which again, is more and more rare these days. Now, the biggest complaint I hear is from the enthusiasts, that this is not a Toyota. And I will agree with them, it's not. The marketing department took a huge risk by taking the super badge and slapping it on a collaboration. It'd be no different than if Ford took the Mustang and had Kia make it. You'd say you'd have the same type of fallout. But the counterpoint is, it's very difficult to make a sports car nowadays. People don't buy them. People complain about them. It's risky. It's expensive to develop. I just appreciate the fact that they're really trying here. This car is, is a truly an achievement. You can scrape away all the deficiencies. The fact that it even exists is amazing. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.